Hello and a very warm welcome indeed to this latest edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is a very special man who is a very special doctor. And here he is, Walter Möbius. Thank you very much for joining us here today on Talking Germany. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Great to have you here. Coming all the way from Bonn, right across at the other side of the country, to be with us here in Berlin. Now, Walter Möbius is, as I said, a very special doctor. Firstly, because he has, down the years, been the personal physician to a number of Germany's leading politicians, including, most prominently, uh, the former Chancellor, Helmut Kohl, with whom he still has a close friendship. But Walter Möbius is also someone who has campaigned actively for more doctors to do something that really ought to come naturally to them, and that is to listen to their patients. Uh, I know that's very, very close to your heart, Walter Möbius, yeah? Uh, but I want to begin with something different. You've had a long and distinguished career. You've had a very, very colourful life. In the middle, something happened. You have said the following. You said... Um, in your life, there was a time before 1985 and a time after 1985. Perhaps yeah, we could been there, begin yeah. there. That's right, because I had in uh, October 1985 a car accident. A motorbike just came in from the left-hand side into my car and um, the driver went over my roof and I was for some seconds knocked out, and my car, it was a Golf, was formed like a U. Oh, yeah. I said before I was bleeding, and maybe I had a little shock, but then I saw this young guy laying in the middle of the road, and I went to him, I was bleeding, and I had a little bit of pain, but I didn't mention it really because I saw that he was, his pulse was very down and uh, I started to reanimate him. Mm -hmm. And then people came on this lonesome road mm -hmm. and said, what are you doing? Are you killing this man? Because, I'm because sorry. it was such a terrible scene and you were, so, you were covered in blood, yeah. you were drenched. Is that, I am doctor, I help him. Please press some tissue here on these rounds where it's bleeding. And my language was very, very uh, alterated because I had a jaw, broke, mm -hmm. broken jaw, mm -hmm. and I was talking like that. Mm -hmm. um, then the uh, <clears throat> ambulance came and uh, the young man unfortunately died after some time. And then I came to a hospital and then I had a life for four weeks in hospital was intensive care unit and everything. This was your own hospital? This was the hospital? First of all, yeah. I was, um, now I came to a small um, country hospital, mm -hmm. but then they saw it's impossible to treat me in the right way. And I came then uh, to my hospital and our surgeon, a uh, very good friend, a very experienced man, uh, decided very soon that I have to be transported to the neurosurgery department mm -hmm. because the head was a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. You, when you were going through this terrible experience, you saw that you saw this young man die in front of your very eyes, but then you were faced with your own uh, suffering because you had multiple injuries. I think, as I understand it, this was a very important moment for you in discovering how important it is, how much compassion and how much physical mm. warmth you are shown in that kind of situation. Um, yes, and that was, for me, maybe my, that saved my life. Two things, the, the doctors were excellent who operated me for six hours. Mm -hmm. And my problem was that I, I lost a lot of blood, but I told them, please, no transfusion. I have, re I'm very, very uh, anxious to get AIDS. Mm -hmm. In those days, it was... Uh, it was a serious issue. Mm -hmm. Serious. And I said, please, no. And they promised me that. And in the moment when I wake up and the anesthetist said to me, everything okay, we didn't need any blood transfusion. I said, like, okay, thank you very much. But then started two days I couldn't breathe really because 
this my jaw was bounded by silver uh, mm -hmm. wires, yeah. like that, and I couldn't sp not naturally speak. And then I had a uh, tube in my stomach just to bring out the fluid mm -hmm. because there was one very dangerous, could have happened, a very dangerous situation. In the moment when I was vomiting and something in my mouth, to close, uh, to open these closed mouth yeah. that was needs two, three, four minutes and then it would have been over. So I said, please, no painkillers, it's okay. And then a very, very experienced uh, and very good nurse talked to me and she trained me to breathe with these, uh, all these problems mm -hmm. in a very soft way, deep, inspirate, expirate. And it reminded me to this famous book of Peter Scholatour, the, 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 the German author, the, the German author. writer. And uh, he described how the Viet Cong lived for hours under the surface of the water and they were breathing with the rice. Exactly. And, and yeah. that, that reminds you, and you have to breathe very slowly, otherwise you would, the uh, little bubbles would give you a normal transportation of the air. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. A fascinating story. We've learned a little bit about what Vol uh, Walter Mobius has to tell us about compassion and calmness in situations of suffering. Those are your first impressions from Walter Mobius. Here is more. Walter Mobius at home in Bonn. He's a doctor, a development aid activist, a man who wears many hats. Born in Bonn in 1937, he remained in the city to study medicine. As a young man, he was an enthusiastic photographer and mountain climber and traveled the world. In 1978, he was appointed chief of medicine at the Johannita Hospital in Bonn. One of his patients was former Chancellor Helmut Kohl. He accompanied him on numerous government trips and the two became close friends. Walter Möbius retired in 2002. Today his life is much less hectic than it was, but he still has a secretary and a private practice at home where he continues to treat a few select patients. He lives in the suburb of Bad Godesberg. That's just a stone's throw from his former workplace, the Johannita Hospital. He worked there for 24 years, even though he retired 12 years ago, he drops by on a regular basis. He still does work for the hospital. Recently, he organized the installation of illuminated landscape photographs in one of the wards. The artwork is his own. Mubius believes that doctors need to spend more time talking with their patients and that hospitals need to have a pleasant environment. If patients feel comfortable and well looked after, their chances of recovery improve. His photographs are also exhibited in the neighboring church. This series of pictures, commissioned by the church and taken on his travels in the last 20 years, is called Children of One World. It's a project he hopes will raise awareness of the youth services offered by the Salesians of Don Boscos. Our guest on Talking Germany today, Walter Möbius. Walter Möbius, born in 1937. Your father was a doctor, and I think I'm right in saying an inspiration for you. It was an inspiration, and since I'm 19 years old, I tried to help him, and that was a very calm form to influence me because I was. Um, the was my bike. I went to the, his patients and brought them some antibiotics or any painkillers in the, in the moment when they are not uh, movable. And so I got a little bit uh, the feeling how are I'm expected by this patient. Sometimes they gave me something, a little 
money, a little tip, <laughs> uh, but that was not important. The stories of these uh, patients, that was for me very funny and, um, and very important. And my father, mm -hmm. in this way, influenced me in a good way. Absolutely, and so I think stories are very important in your life. There, there are some very interesting stories. You've spent a lot of time on the road, as we heard in the report, and you, um, one, uh, you've always said that when you are traveling, you're always a doctor. Yeah, when you're out there in the world. And there was, there's one story uh, about, a, about a snake bite in Brazil that I know is very important to you. Yeah, and that's a, <laughs> a story who was very, very special because in those days, I didn't have any ECG, no computer tomogram, no MR, nothing. Mm -hmm. Just my hands, my nose, None my None of eyes. the machinery. No machinery at all. And uh, there was a young uh, father, he was, um, had a snake bite, and the shaman was dancing since five days. The shaman? He'd been the shaman. Five days dancing. Five days dancing. Mm -hmm. uh, but he became worse and worse, and uh, then the um, head of this little village, the Yamomani village, uh, wanted to ha to bring me together with. But the Shemaine said, wait, 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 what they told me. And then a little girl with a cat came to me and said uh, something I didn't understand, but then he showed me one of the feet of the uh, cat mm -hmm. and there was a two centimeter dawn between. A thistle. A thistle. A thistle in there, yeah. And she was, whew, for a short time, the count against me, but then I took my pincet, took it out, and she ran away. Mm -hmm. And the whole village was very impressed. Oh. And then I had a lot of to do with little rounds with uh, uh, angina and so on. And uh, then the shaman uh, said, he can come. And I saw this young man and his knee was inflammated and like that. Like a football. Like a football. Mm -hmm. And then I gave him a painkiller, aspirin, and put it in a glass. And then the bubbles were going on and he was fascinated by this. This is very important, I think. I gave him to drink this little special cocktail and then an antibiotic. And after a short time, I saw disappointment on the faces of the surrounding uh, people. And I said to my father, Erda, my friend, we have to do something special. And then we put the tissue on his knee and some water all the time to cool it. And then with a big uh, fan, they moved it all the night. Every four, quarter of an hour, they changed the people and all the night the fan cooled the whole person and special the knee down. And that was the help of the community. Mm. And for them, <clears throat> it was like a miracle because he was better and you could save his life in this way. Mm. It's interesting though, when you, talk, when you talk about what a doctor can achieve, what a doctor can do, a story comes to mind. I, I know that you have said that doctors really only learn from their mistakes, from the setbacks that they are faced with. And I know that one of the, one of the other important stories, milestones in your career, was a terrible sort of tragedy, a moment of great anguish for you, was the story of a 16-year-old girl called Isabel, where you really, you, you, you hit your limits as a doctor. <clears throat> yeah, she was suffering from... Um, a cancer, a very, very, very uh, bad form. And we treated her for one year in combination with the university hospital for special uh, treatment. It was only possible to, in, the, in Cologne, Professor Gross was the doctor there. And in this combination, I had very often to take care of her because she had times when she was very depressed, very depressed. And then I tried to help her. 
we talk to each other and I said, wait on that day or two, it will become better. And later she died after one year that was for everybody, for our hospital team, for the nurses, for the doctors and especially me. But the most important person who suffered most was the family. And 10 years later, the mother, Crystal Sacher, wrote a book. Mm -hmm. We meet again in, our, in my paradise. And that was the last sentence she wrote in her letter to me because it was in those days in India mm -hmm. when she died. And this book is a very, very well accepted all over the world. It's translated in 25 or 26 languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, special for young people who are suffering from this cancer or leukemia, it helps because, because it demonstrates how a young girl can survive for a year in a quite a good condition. Of course, it's going up and down, but the, uh, um, under the uh, general uh, judgment, model, we would say it's good. Okay. Thank you too for that. Now, if you're ill, one thing I suppose that you want most of all, perhaps, is a good and reliable diagnosis of what exactly the problem is. But how likely are you to get a sound diagnosis if doctors here in Germany only take an average of eight minutes, yes, eight minutes, to assess what might be wrong? It might be enough time to measure some vital functions, but it is not enough time to listen to what the patient is actually going through. And that is a problem. Mobius, too much machinery, too much medication, that seems to be the problem. <clears throat> First of all, I, I wanted to point out we are all very happy and everybody can be happy that we have an excellent machinery and the development in high-tech medicine is fantastic. Yeah. Let's see what good There's a but here. coming, there's a but. <laughs> but on the other hand, <laughs> on the other side, there very often the patients are suffering from one very important thing. There is too less time mm -hmm. to talk to my doctor. Mm -hmm. And if somebody has a severe diagnosis, you can't do it in one or two minutes to tell them you have cancer and we have to operate. You have to know how to can influence him and to get but you have to feel sorry for the doctors because they, I mean, they're not getting paid for these long, searching conversations that you are proposing. This is a problem of our health system. Mm -hmm. it, and I would like to have it for the doctors because if they get better paid, then the patients would be more content, of course. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we should change and we, uh, the system in this way, but that's a very, very difficult political thing. thing. Well, pol politics is one aspect. I, do you know, I found, a, I found a quote from you, a contribution you made to this debate, and you said, doctors must be good listeners, doctors must demonstrate compassion, doctors must be trustworthy, and the list goes on. It's quite a sort of a, it, that, that, that's a, it, it, it's a, quite a skill set that you expect doctors to have. And as far as I know, doctors are not trained to have these skills, or are they? Uh, and there is a change at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy about to hear that in some university uh, hospitals, they train young students in communication and in talking to the patient. Mm. And one very important thing is uh, that they are trained sometimes with actors. Actors can come to the hospital or a training center as patient. And they, of course, they are healthy, but they have pain and they are crying. And then the young the students have to get in touch with him, have to help him. And then they, very often they make videos yeah. and afterwards the professor or the leader of this uh, training center explains them what is good 
and what is wrong and what could be better. Well, that sounds, that sounds good. I like the idea. What, what about if I were to come to you as a patient? I'm saying, Dr. Merbius, mir geht's nicht gut. I'm not well. Yeah. What would you do to make me feel comfortable and possibly give me a sort of a health yeah. boost immediately? Yeah, because I'm an older doctor now and have some experience. <laughs> to put I, it my I hope <laughs> to see very, very soon, is it a dangerous situation or not. But if, it, if you come to me and say, I have pain and I don't feel comfortable, then I would, first of all, sit down, tell me since when you have this pain or this feeling of not comf being comfortable. I let you explain me the things. I listen to you. What a life, yeah? What a character. Uh, you met Helmut Kohl, Walter Möbius, I think sometime in the early 80s, around the time that he was actually becoming German 81. Chancellor. 81. Okay. Yeah. What were your first impressions? <laughs> a very, very important person. And he came as a patient. Mm -hmm. And it was not so difficult to help him. And that the first impression of me was, what a man. A man. What a man. What an important man. And later... I see, what a man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay, I'm with you now. Okay, I'm catching up, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, <clears throat> later, I accompanied him on some of his very special and very important trips yeah. to other countries. And... The first close connection started when, in 1989, 89, in September, uh, when he was ill, and yeah. I accompanied him on the uh, par CDU party. Let me explain for our viewers, yeah, because what happened in 1989, it, it's very famous in German sort of political history, yeah. recent political history, there was a, there was a party conference of a Helmut Kohl's CDU Conservative Party, and there, were, there was a clique who had got together and they wanted to dump him. They wanted him out, yeah? And you were the doctor behind the scenes and Helmut Kohl was ill. He shouldn't have been there, yeah? What but, did you tell him? Uh, there was only one chance to be all the time close to him, but in the background. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told him, if there's anything happening during your fever attack, for example, then I'm close to you and I can help you, but we will manage it. And uh, on Monday, uh, that was his very, very important speech, mm -hmm. he twice had a little uh, attack of fever rising up and his voice was for seconds a little bit like broken. Yeah. And in this moment I told him, if this happens, take a glass of water. Yeah. yeah. Because that's normal when you are talking one and a half hour. And then you will come over this situation. And that went well. And he came with a lot, a lot of um, standing ovations after his speech. And the others were out of business. It's, it's an amazing story because it, because it makes Helmut Kohl seem like some sort of Shakespearean figure up on the stage under pressure, tottering, almost fighting for his life. And you say a, a glass of water for, uh, for, uh, from Walter Merbius saved the day. Yeah? yeah. I want to go back to what you said about uh, him being, you said, what a man. What made you think, what a man? I mean, he was a big man. He is a big man. He's a big man. But uh, the first moment when he entered uh, my ambulance, he was so um, nice and so uh, to my secretary. Mm -hmm. And in the moment, there was an atmosphere of confidence between him and my secretary. Mm -hmm. And then I came and then um, said hello. And then we had this atmosphere of confidence to mm -hmm. each other. 
that was very soon in our so he was, the, he was the kind of person who could communicate yes because that was important empathy. in his dealings with for example gorbachev yeah that was sure. really really central he had a lot of empathy and uh, we we were not so good friends in the first moment mm -hmm. because that a political man, the chancellor of our state. And of course, uh, he, I had a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. But during the years, there was more and more things which brought us together. Okay. And now we have a relationship of very good confidence and friendship. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud about that. Okay, so you've accompanied, you've been on a journey with Helmut Kohl that's been quite a long yeah. journey now, over a number of decades, yeah? And what we've seen in that time is we've seen Helmut Kohl being celebrated as the Chancellor of German reunification, obviously a very important historic role, but we've also seen his career being overshadowed by a party funding scandal that was not insignificant, yeah? Uh, that was a big blot on his career, I think it's fair to say, without a doubt. I don't want to pry into what you know or don't know about Helmut Kohl and who he is, but I, I'm very curious, and I think a lot of people are curious about, do you think that Helmut Kohl is at peace with himself? I would say, yeah, yeah, yes. Because, um, of course, after um, 2002, he, he had a lot of diseases. Mm. Everybody, everybody knows that. Yeah. And, uh, but, and now he is a little bit handicapped, of course. But if you talk to him, personal, you can communicate, you can laugh with him. He's asking me what's going on with your book, for example. He's mm. very interested to hear about it. And this is always in a very calm atmosphere when, I'm, when I visit him together with his wife. And I'm happy that he is now somebody who, as you ask me, he is in peace with himself. Good news for Helmut Kohl. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we've been mentioning Helmut Kohl, we've talked about German reunification, and uh, after that whole process, the process of reunification, the country faced a tough decision about which city, Bonn or Berlin, should become the seat of government. There was a very tense vote in Parliament on the 20th of June 1991. The outcome was 338 votes for Berlin, 320 for Bonn, so it was a close thing. Uh, Berlin is now uh, the hub of politics here in Germany, but you might be surprised to hear uh, that there are a number of ministries that are still located in the former capital, Bonn. Well, Tamubius, we, we discovered earlier, or we, we didn't discover, we were told, we found out that you were born in Bonn. But at the time when there was this big debate going on, Bonn or Berlin as the capital of Germany and the seat of government, you were for Berlin. Um, I was for Berlin yeah. because after the reunification, uh, Berlin is in the middle and it was the old capital. And uh, for me, it was uh, no discussion. Mm. Of course, I f feel a little pity because we lost something very interesting that was on the market, for example, on Saturday morning when all the people from countries all over the world came together. It was a very, very uh, exciting atmosphere. Mm -hmm. There were Africans, there were Chinese people, and this gave us uh, a feeling a little bit more than a provincial town. To, but to but I, I mean, I go to Bonn quite recently. It's a, it's a very international town these days, is it not? It is. It's the United yeah, but, Nations, as we learned in the report yeah, and all this. Yeah. But, uh, if you compare it in those days, mm. it's a big difference because all the embassies were there. True. And, uh, mm. But on the other side, uh, we have to look in future. Mm -hmm. Berlin was important to be the capital again. Mm -hmm. And I think nowadays, all the people in Bonn accept that. And they 
Do the people, I mean, I know that people will not say this to a journalist, or not many people in Bond will say it to a journalist, but I think my, my sense is that most people accept the logic that sooner rather than later, those ministries need to be in yeah. Berlin. Yeah, yeah? absolutely, mm. right. Mm. Just, uh, just, uh, just give me what, one insight into what kind of, I mean, here in Germany, people say there is the Berlin Republic. That's the, that's the uh, Germany run from Berlin. And there was the Bonn Republic. Yeah. yeah? What was the Bonn Republic like? Because people sort of, you know, have a lot of nostalgia for what it was like. It was intimate somehow. Yes, and it, it was closer. Um, <clears throat> if you lived in the middle of Bonn, you were very close to any embassies, to events, parties, everything was close together. In Berlin, it's a little bit more widespread. Mm -hmm. But uh, the people and nostalgia is an important thing. Of course, they say that was fantastic with all these international fluidum what we had. Yeah. Uh, but today it's a little bit different but it's not bad. We are happy in Bonn. <laughs> and I am happy in Bonn. <laughs> Good thing too. I'm going to break you off now because we... Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just learning. We, we're, we're running out of time. We normally finish the, the show with a quiz. One question for you as a doctor. Is life more about joy or about suffering? Um, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, I would say it's a combination. You only can feel joy if you know what suffering is. We're going to leave it there. Wise words. That's all we have time for with Walter Merbius, this week's guest on Talking Germany. As I said, he's a very special doctor and a very special man. If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, do come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss.